Hello, um, in this video we're going to look at uh, the B cell and the T cell story. So the story of the B and T cells as well as we will introduce lymphoma, particularly the B cell lymphoma. So I'm just introducing the organs here uh, that are associated with the B and T cells. We have the bone marrow, the thymus, and the lymph node. Now in the bone marrow, there are lymphoid progenitor cells, which can either become a precursor T cell or a precursor B cell. Let us follow the precursor T cells. The precursor T cells will move into the, thy uh, the thymus, where they become thymocytes, double negative. Uh, they are double negative because they are, they are negative for both uh, CD4 and CD8 receptors. In the thymus, however, the double negative thymocytes will develop to become either a, CD, a CD8 naive T cell, which will have the CD8 receptor, or a CD4 naive T cell with a CD4 receptor. Uh, the naive CD4 and CD8 T cells will also have a T cell receptor on them. And the naive CD4 or naive T cells will then move into the lymph node to, uh, ready to become activated. Now let us look to the bone marrow and follow the precursor B cell. With the help of the enzyme RAG1 and 2, the precursor B cell in the bone marrow will undergo VDJ recombination of light and heavy chains to form a naive B cell with a membrane bound IgM antibody. So the naive B cell actually um, will have a unique, you can say, a specific type of antibody on its surface for a specific type of antigen. So the naive B cell will leave the bone marrow and proceed to the lymph node. Um, during circulation or within the lymph node, the naive B cell, if the naive B cell's IgM, surface, surface bound IgM, recognizes an antigen, it will phagocytize it and then present the antigen on an MHC class 2 molecule on its cell surface. Now the, ex uh, the experienced naive B cell now waits for either co-stimulation or stimulation by a activated CD4 T cell. So we're, we're going to look at the, what happens in co-stimulation. So let us just say this naive CD4 T cell can recognize the antigen being presented by the uh, B cell. What happens next is called co-stimulation. The naive CD4 T cell stimulates the naive B cell and the naive B cell stimulates the CD4 T cell. Alternatively, alternatively what could have happened is that a fully activated CD4 T cell could have activated the naive B cell. But anyways, what we end up with is an activated CD4 T cell and an activated B cell. When the B cell is activated by the T cell, something big happens. There are cytokines that the T cell will secrete that trigger the naive B cell to proliferate into centroblasts. During the proliferation process, each individual B cell undergoes what is known as somatic hypermutation by the AID enzyme. Somatic hypermutation introduces point mutation in the variable region of the antibody gene. Thus, what we end up with are we end up with many central blasts, each with different surface IgM antibodies because their variable regions have slightly changed thanks to the mutations. So these central blasts can have antibodies with either an increased or decreased affinity to that antigen. The central blasts then move through the germinal center to where there are many uh, follicular dendritic cells presenting many antigens on its surface. There are also follicular T helper cells in this area.
When the central blasts move from one part of the germinal center to the other, they become centrocytes. And these centrocytes need cytokines in order to survive and mature. So they sample these antigens presented by the dendritic cells using their newly acquired specific surface IgM antibody. Unfortunately, some centrocytes will have decreased affinity to these antigens after under undergoing somatic hypermutation. The ones that have decreased affinity will die through apoptosis. Fortunately, however, there are centrocytes that will have an increased affinity following hypermutation, and so will easily recognize the antigen presented by the follicular dendritic cell. So if these centrocytes recognize the antigen, it will again engulf it and present it to the T helper follicular cell nearby. The T helper follicular cell will now help, um, help the B cell, help the centrocyte, which is the B cell, help the centrocyte to proliferate and then to differentiate. The centrocyte can differentiate into memory B cell or into a plasmoblast, which will then become a plas plasma cell. Plasma cells are the type of B cells that secrete antibodies. When the centrocyte receives signals by the, from the T cells to differentiate, the centrocytes actually undergo class switching, which is basically where the constant region of the, of the, of a, of the antibody can, can become a, a specific class. So it can change into an IgE, IgA, or IgG, for example. Now, I hope that made sense. Um, I also, we also have to introduce the thymic B cells, which are B cells that reside in the thymus. But we will not go into the functions of the thymic B cells here. Okay, so what you have watched till now was an overview, overall picture, sorry, of the T cell and particularly the B cell story. Now we will start looking at lymphoma, which as the name suggests, is tumor of the lymph. Lymphoma involves cancer cells coming from mainly T or B cell development. So using this diagram, we can see in which steps of the T and B cell development these, cancers, these cancer cells may arise from and what type of lymphoma can result. So lymphoma. Lymphoma is a heterogeneous group of malignancies characterized by proliferation of lymphoid tissue. Diverse, and they are diverse in cellular origin, morphology, immunophenotype, cyto, cyto, cytogenetic and molecular abnormalities, and they're different um, in response to treatment and prognosis. So they're a big deal. Lymphoma can be categorized into two broad categories. These are Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In this video, we will focus on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is the sixth most frequent cancer, and it is increased and it is increasing in prevalence. Risk factors for non-Hodgkin lymphoma include immunological disturbances, viral, genetic, and environmental. So immunological can be HIV or autoimmune diseases, which predisposes one to lymphoma. Viruses such as HIV, epsilon bar virus, and HCV are risk factors also for lymphoma. Genetics, as in Klinefelter's uh, and SCID, increases the risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And environmental risk factors include pesticides, herbicides, and smoking. Okay, now let us look at the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and where they can arise from. So non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can either be uh, can either be B cell or T cell in origin. We will first look at the T cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So T cells in the thymus during its development can give rise to precursor T cell lymphomas, which we won't go into. Similarly, T cells that have moved into the lymph node can give rise to what's called the peripheral T cell lymphomas, the neoplasma. Now, T-cell lymphomas can arise during genetic rearrangement of the T-cell receptor and during positive and negative selection in the thymus, which will lead to uh, either precursor or peripheral T-cell lymphomas. Of course, that's 
like that was just super basic overview. Now, what is important to know is that T cell lymphomas are less common than B cell lymphomas. So we will just so we just looked at two types, two, two, two classes, you can say, of T cell lymphomas. Now let us focus on B cell lymphomas. Um, and we'll go into more detail. We will focus more on the B cell lymphomas because, as I mentioned just then, the prevalence of the B cell lymphoma is much higher than the T cell. And this is because B cells undergo so many genetic changes during its development. Naive B cells can give rise to mantle cell lymphoma. B cells that have experienced an antigen encountered can become a chronic lymphocytic leukemia or small lymphoc uh, lymphocytic lymphoma. Lymphoma and leukemia can often be confusing. They are different yet related. The main difference is that leukemia involves the blood. Anyways, we won't really talk about leukemia and lymphoma in this video, but it's just good to know that this particular part of the B cell development can lead to the chronic lymphocytic leukemia or the small lymphocytic lymphoma. The central blasts in the germinal center can give rise to Burkitt's lymphoma and germinal center B-like diffuse large B cell lymphoma or DLBCL, which has, interestingly, 60% five-year survival. Both Burkitt's lymphoma and um, germ cell B-like diffuse large B cell lymphoma are some of the common types of B cell lymphomas because possibly uh, because of the genetic mutation that occurs following somatic hypermutation in the germ uh, germinal center. So what I mean is that following hypermutation in the germinal center, which is a normal process, it can lead to mutations leading to cancer, which is the Burkitt's lymphoma or the large B cell, large diffuse B cell lymphoma. <clears throat> the centrocytes can give rise to follicular lymphoma. Memory B cells following class switching, which is another genetic rearrangement, can give rise to chronic lymphocytic leukemia or the small lymphocytic lymphoma, as, uh, uh, as we've already introduced earlier. Plasma blasts can give rise to activated B-cell-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which has a 35% five-year survival. So now we have actually talked about two types of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Well, we actually have three, and the third one arises from the thymic B-cells. So here, the thymic B-cells can give rise to what is called the primary mediastinal B-cell-like diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So we have one, two, three types of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Anyways, the reason it is important to know that, uh, to know this is because the most common non-Hodgkin's B cell lymphoma are the diffuse large B cell lymphomas as well as the follicular lymphomas. So that is why it's important to know these. So those were the major types of lymphomas I wanted to talk about. But using this diagram, it is also important to introduce a common type of cancer which arises from one, of, one, uh, one particular cell, which are the plasma cells. Plasma cells can give rise to multiple myeloma in which uh, there are so much, there's so much plasma cells being produced and moving into the bone marrow that it causes big problems. And I will have a video on that, hopefully. A link to the video, hopefully. So, so far we've talked about the B uh, and T cell story and we've introduced the different types of uh, lymphomas. Now let us look at the, the reason why they arise. So I guess the molecular aspect of this, of lymphoma, which is important. So we just looked at the T and the B cell story as well as the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that can arise during different uh, periods of the development of the B and T cells. Now let us look at some, um, now let's look at the pathophysiology, basically 
how do these lymphomas arise? And they basically arise mainly through genetics, uh, genetic changes such as one, translocation, and two, mutations during uh, development, during uh, like somatic hypermutation, for example, or class switching. So the translocations of chromosomes are seen in many of the lymphomas. Translocation of, for example, the BC, BCL2 and BCL6 uh, genes are seen in a lot of lymphomas. Um, and also we can see mutations and amplifications of certain genes, such as mutations in the P53 gene, the BCL2, the BCL6, and the MYC genes. So that's, so just overall know that lymphomas arise from genetic changes such as translocations and mutations during the, during the development of the cells. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video.